Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Taylor and I'm a lecturer in civil engineering. This is unit three and we're going to look at the railway track and this is part one of two. In this unit we're going to look at the track as a system. We're going to look at the sleepers, the fasteners, the rail pads, and then we're also going to look at joints and connections, in particular welding techniques. So during this lesson, I aim to describe the methods of joining shorter rails together. We're going to illustrate the key features of fish plated joints. And we're going to provide some details on the two most common forms of on-site rail welding. So at the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain the load transfer path of fish plated joints, illustrate methods of maintaining a fish plated joint, describe the thermit and flashbot welding processes, and recommend the type of weld most appropriate in a particular application. So first of all, we'll just start off looking at rail joints, and in particular, why we need to join rails. So if you recall the videos on the manufacturing of rail section, they're generally manufactured in short lengths, which are loaded onto trains and eventually jointed together on site. So historically, the fish plate was the first form of joint, and that's shown in the top photograph here, where we drill holes in the end of the rails, the bolts go through, and the plates then compress the connection. Now welding is preferred. The bottom figure shows where two rails have been butted together and then welded. The fish plate is a fallback option and is still widely used to this day. So now we're going to look at the subject of fish plates. So why are they called fish plates? Well, no one really knows for sure, but I've got some ideas. So possible answer number one. The fish in this term is derived from the French word fiche, meaning a peg. Fiche, in turn, is derived from the old French word fichier, which means to fasten. Thus, a fish plate means a plate that fastens. The aim of a fish plate is to transmit bending moment and shearing force by external loads, i.e. the train, from one member to another, the members being the rails that are connected together. If combined moment of inertia of fish plates is equal to that of the members and joints are 100% efficient, then bending moment and shear force in fish plates will be the same. In practice, moment of inertia in fish plate is less due to the imperfect efficiency. So supported joints are when a joint is located over a sleeper. Sometimes two sleepers may be bolted together to form a more stable base. The advantages are it provides additional support for impact loads, helps maintain longitudinal profile. The disadvantages are that it's difficult to pack the balance under the joint. Rail fasteners and fist plate obstruction make them difficult to maintain. It relies on sleepers being in the right place. Suspended joints are when the joint is between two sleepers. Advantages include the load being equally distributed, even movement of the rail ends, and also provides greater elasticity to the track. The disadvantages are that they may require more maintenance due to movement. Square or unstaggered joints are where the joints are directly opposite each other. These are most common in straight track. It minimises the number of wheel impacts and it's easier to maintain and reduces the risk of the track twisting. Stagger joints are where the joint in one rail is opposite to the center of the other. It's often used on curves. The main advantage is that it provides better resistance to the centrifugal forces that are applied. The disadvantage is that there are more joint impacts The diagram on the left shows a cross section through a rail section with a fish plate. It also shows the geometry. A gap exists between the fish plate and the rail web. That's shown in green. Forces are transferred across the fishing surfaces at the top and bottom, shown by the red lines. 
It's not intended that the couple is developed by the interaction between the bolts and the holes in the web. The bolt hole is actually bigger than the bolt to allow for expansion. The slope on the fishing surface is an important consideration. The shallower the slope, the greater the force across the fishing surface and the more efficient the joint. The shallower the angle, the greater the pull required to maintain a clamping force when the fishing surfaces wear. A compromise is needed. It's generally of the ratio of 1 to 2.5 to 1 to 2.75 being the best. So fish plates are either cast, rolled or forged. The longitudinal ribs along the fish plate make the fish plate stiffer and form a groove in which the square heads of the fish plate bolts sit in to prevent turning when being tightened. The holes for the fish bolts are formed by either drilling, hot punching or machining. So the flat bottom rail bolt has a square head. The head engages in the fish plate groove. Bullhead rail has a circular head with an oval nib under the head. The nib engages with a pear shaped hole in the plate to prevent turning when tightened. Continuously welded rail is typically supplied undrilled. In the UK, holes are required of 30mm diameter with a clearance of 65mm above the foot of the rail and a clearance from the end of the rail of 60mm. The holes are usually at 127mm centres or pitch. A principal source of rail fatigue is development around bolt holes or fatigue cracks. This is known as star cracking. It can be reduced in likelihood by cold expansion. An oversized mandrel is pulled through a disposable stainless steel sleeve. There are different types of fish plate. For example, a lift fish plate is used where the same rail section is used but has a differing amount of headwear. Junction fish plates are where different rail sections are to be joined together. Clamp fish plates are used for temporary or emergency use. They don't have any fish bolts. The plates are held by a clamp under the foot of the rail and they're used for rail ends awaiting welding or to hold a cracked rail weld. Insulated joints are sometimes required. They're needed on tracks which are physically connected but must be electrically separate. This is the case in conventional track circuit arrangements. The joints use wood, plastic or nylon as an insulating layer between the fish plate and the rail with end posts of insulating material between the rail ends. Insulating and load spreading washers are used for fish bolts. Glued joints are also used and more durable, for example epoxy resin can be used. Insulated rail joints can cause some quite serious problems in terms of maintenance. Watch the video showing the inspection regime for IRJs on the main line by Network Rail. It illustrates how they can cause critical problems associated with, for example, track circuit failures. So at regular intervals, the bolts have to be removed from the fish plates, the fishing surfaces have to be re-greased, and the bolts then repositioned and torqued appropriately. Here you can see an operative using a bance, which is pretty much a two-stroke power engine powered drill that provides sufficient torque to ensure that the bolts are correctly tightened. Metal wear occurs on the fishing surfaces. A worn joint increases impact loads and damage and puts bolts out of alignment. Shims or tapered steel inserts are used to restore. Joints by the nature of greater deflection and therefore track degradation can occur. They must be regularly checked and maintained. Joints often suffer from vertical deformation due to the cyclic loading. Rail end straightening will correct this. There are various items of plant that are available to do this job. Here we can see some examples from Mannequin and from Permaquip. 
Lubrication of the fishing surfaces optimises couple and allows movement of the rail ends due to thermal stress. These should be undertaken regularly using either spray grease or applying grease using a brush as shown here. On the 12th of July 2013, a train crash occurred in the commune of bretigny sur orge in the southern suburbs of Paris, France, where a passenger train carrying 385 people derailed and hit the station platform. Seven people were killed and there were 11 serious injuries and 12 minor injuries. The accident was cited to be the most serious rail crash in France since the, since the 1988 Gare de Lyon accident in which 56 people were killed. The SNCF released its initial findings on the 13th of July 2013, reporting that the derailment appeared to have been caused by a track failure. A steel fish plate connecting two rails came loose 200 metres from the station at a set of switches and became stuck in them. The last axle of the third carriage is thought to have been the first to have hit the fish plate. The French accident investigation team had a number of conclusions from the accident. The overall expertise in bolted track joints should be improved, including technical specifications and the quality of components, and that specifications for tightening bolts should be observed during the installation and maintenance. Regulations were changed and they specify measures to be taken when defects are detected. They also set maximum timescales allowed for repairs to be undertaken. Switches and crossings require a higher level of maintenance and early renewal should be identified and such requirements are considered in reliable and auditable manner when managing maintenance activities. So the fundamental lesson learned from this accident is that the best rail joint is one that isn't even there at all. So this now brings us on to the subject of welding. Welding removes the need for fish plates. Track welding comprises three main areas. Welding of plain rail into long strings for relaying or new track, the manufacture of switch and crossing components from plain rail, and the repair and resurfacing of rail. There are five key types, flash butt, thermit, electric arc, arc brazing, powder spray. Welding is a very important process which must be taken under carefully controlled conditions so as not to damage the metallurgical properties of the steel. So let's have a look at flash butt welding. So a flash butt weld is a welded joint between two abutting rails made by a flash welding process. So in flash butt welding, a high electrical current is passed across components at low voltage, one rail projected towards the other in a controlled manner. Electrical resistance heating causes surface irregularities to melt. The temperature of the whole interface approaches near melting point. Once sufficient heat, the components are forced together. Excess molten steel is forced out of the welded area. The flash butt weld process includes the preparation, which is examination of the quality of the rail, particularly of second hand, for visual or also ultrasonic defects. We then have to clean the rail, remove any rust or scale from the electrode contact areas by passing through a degreasing unit in the shot blasting cabinet. For welding, we feed the rails into the machine, clamp in position and commence the weld, which is fully automated. The fourth procedure is trimming. Once the weld is solidified, shears are used to trim the excess steel off. Then we have to allow the weld to cool. If the rail cools too quickly, martensite or bainite transformations will occur, with possible embrittlement and cracking as a result. We then have to straighten the weld by pressing. The welded joint is pressed vertically and laterally to straighten. Then we have to smooth off the surface and we do that by grinding. We then have to have a final QA check, which is a visual and ultrasonic check 
and keep a record of the welding parameters used during the welding process. Here you can see a flash butt welding machine mounted on a wheeled excavator platform. The device has road rail equipment so it can drive off a trailer down to the track side, mount the track and lower the wheels, the rail wheels, to allow it to travel along the rails. So rather than just having a bucket at the end of the boom, this machine has an end effector which includes the clamps and welding equipment which allows it to undertake flash butt welding. Network Rail have a YouTube video showing their machine in action. You can watch this on the Virtual Learning Environment page. So now we're going to have a look at thermic welding. Aluminothermic welding or thermit welding is a cast joint between prepared rail ends using a crucible and sand moulds. The process of thermit welding was discovered in 1896 by Professor Hans Goldschmidt. It's based on the reduction of heavy metal oxides by aluminium. Once the reaction has been started by a suitable heat source, the aluminium reacts with the metal oxide, liberating metal and generating heat in excess of 2500 degrees centigrade. Heavy metal separates, which floats to the top. The generation of liquid metal and heat means it can be used to weld. The procedure includes the preparation of the rail gap, the joint alignment, attachment of the moulds, the preparation of the crucible, preheating, and then the thermic reaction. Upon tapping, the thermic steel pours into the mould, filling the gap between the rail ends. The weld then solidifies for five minutes, then the excess is trimmed off. We then, after a period of 20 minutes, grind the surface and then we inspect for quality assurance purposes.
let's now just do a comparison between flash butt and thermic welding processes and examine where they would be most appropriate for use. So when considering the two welding techniques, in terms of quality, thermic welds can be more rigid and less flexible when moved. Overhead line electrification can sometimes restrict the use of a flash butt welding machine. There can also be site constraints. For example, the flash butt welding machine may need to be on the adjacent track, so a full position will be required. If sufficient space, rail may be possible to weld in the forefoot between the rails. In terms of planning, the flashbot welding machine needs to be booked scheduled, so it's less reactive. In terms of cost and volume, the flashbot welding machine incurs delivery transportation costs, so it's best for high volume work. In terms of the cost volume comparison, as we increase the number of welds, the price per weld for thermic welding increases. But as we increase the number of welds, if we consider mobile flashbot welding, the price per weld decreases. So if we have only a few welds, thermic welding is appropriate. If we have lots of welding required, then the mobile, mobile flashbot welding machine would be more economically viable. So that's the end of Unit 3, Part 1. Thanks for listening and bye for now.